You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. If it wasn't for my youngest son and, and that little dog of mine, I'm telling you, Panama, I wouldn't be sitting here right now because, man, it just, I mean, it just, it just really made a difference. And then for Wounded Warrior Project to come in and to say, you know what, don't worry about nothing. Well, man, I got you. I got you. You don't have to, we don't care if you feel ashamed. We don't care about this little ugly crime I'm doing. You know, we, we, we got you. We're going to have your back. And we're going to hold you up, sister, until it's time for you to stand on your own two feet. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for by and about black culture here at the Real Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. And today we have a show for you where we're going to be discussing uh, some more serious, more important, more vital uh, topic. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, or maybe it's Mental Health Month. Uh, here in America, and one of the groups that for which this is essentially important are our veterans. So in the spirit of this, we have invited two individuals uh, who are part of the Wounded Warrior Project, which I will have them explain so we can make sure we get the absolute right definition so people can understand exactly what that is. Um, full disclosure, I'm, a, I'm an Army brat. I grew up overseas in the military having a discussion offline about what that even means. Where am I from? All that kind of stuff. And I think that's a conversation a lot of us military kids have to have, especially those of us who spent the majority of our growing up life overseas. But I would like to introduce my two uh, my two panelists today, my two guests. We're going to start with Tanya Oxendine, who is an Army vet, did 30 years in the military. Uh, she said most of that time before brag. And I'm going to have you all introduce yourself eventually through the through the conversation, too. But so we can get to it. I'm going to start with the big picture stuff. And we have Will Williamson, who is a VP at the Wounded Warrior Project, uh, who is a Marine vet, right? Marine, Marine vet, right? He's a good yes, question before we jump into it. Do people call him Marine brats or is this military brat? Because it's Army brat. I know on our end. Right. No, in the Marine Corps, it's just military brat. Mil- yeah, okay. most Army brat, but just mainly across the board, like Will said, military brat. <laughs> Got you, got you. All right. Well, one, thank you both for being here. I appreciate your time. We appreciate your service. Uh, just thank you for everything you've done for for the country in any capacity in which you have, because, uh, you know, I, serving in the military is a very selfless thing to do. You know, anybody who puts your life on the line, uh, first responders, but in the military, all that stuff is, is always something we need to appreciate. So let's you know, and I hope to get more of you all's personal story through the conversation. But let's start with the big picture, the big picture. Why did each of you join the military to begin with? So, Tanya, let's start with you. Why did I join the military? Well, for mainly one reason that we were poor as crap. We didn't have a lot of anything. Uh, I, I don't come from a military family. I, my uncles were in Vietnam and that, but my immediate family, it was just me, my mom and my brother. She was a single parent of both of us. Um, I grew up in St. Augustine, Florida, and um, like I said, we were, you know, poor on food stamps and welfare. Sometimes our electricity would be cut off and things like that. So I didn't want to live that type of life. And one day I was just, just walking to my friend's house and saw the recruiting station, um, and it had Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And if the Marine door was the first door, I would be a Marine like Will. <laughs> the Army was the first <laughs> door, <laughs> so I joined the Army. So. That, that that that's why I joined it. That's how I end up joining the joining the army. All right. Well Yeah. <laughs> Actually a very similar story. Um so my family's originally from Jamaica. Um I grew up in New York and um my dad and my uncles actually got drafted into Vietnam, so my dad was a part of the Big Red One uh, during that experience. Um so yeah, I always tell people my parents had a lot of love but not a lot of money. And uh right when I was graduating from high school, um I, I was part of a summer internship program. And at the end of the program, I was uh, I was asking, like, you know, how can I, I wanted to be a lawyer. How can I afford to go to law school, you know, and go to college to become a lawyer? And I said, well, my parents don't, you know, have that, you know, the kind of money to to send me to law school or or even to college. And and then the person at the exit interview was saying, well, have you ever thought about the military? And I was like, oh, my goodness, my father's going to kill me if I should put the military. You know, um, but, yeah, I ended up uh, walking in. I knew I wasn't going to join the Army because my father just, you know, he had his Vietnam experience, so I knew that was ne- not, not necessarily going to be my road. And um, I met the Marine Corps recruiters, who's actually still my mentor today. Um, still a really good friend of mine, and I ended up joining the Marine Corps. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting um, that you said that last part. 
my father told me not to join the military. He was very adamant <laughs> about that. Now, Shrunk. which is interesting because I, you know, so many, my time in the military, so to speak, as, as a kid was wonderful. I loved it. You know, like, uh, and I come from a family of military. My mother is in the military. My uncles, aunts, my grandfather served in World War I. Uh, you know, like I have a ton of people in my family have used it similarly as a way out, right? right. For so many people, a way to get for some of them, it was a way out. My father's generation for cousins and, 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 um, other siblings, it was a, a way to get money for college. It was a way to get where you're trying to go. So it was always interesting to me. My father was just so adamant about me not joining the military with, and, and, and I didn't, you know, I went to, I went straight to college route. Um, but I think it was just the the black man in the military, historically, those conversations, he was very much like, listen, I've did all this, so you don't have to do this. Um, which always conflicted. Cause again, I loved all, now I wasn't in the army, but right. I love, <laughs> I love the life that it provided for me. And that's how I always viewed the military as, as a provision of, of safety, of space, of it sent me to live in places I would never, ever be. You know, I was born in Panama at Fort Clayton, um, like I'm, you know, I'm an international kid because of all of that stuff. So it's always, that's always been one of the interesting conversations he and I have had, which is like, don't do this thing that helped you get to exactly where you are today. This, right. this wonderful life I provided for you. Um, yeah, that's interesting really. that you bring that up because I actually had a similar com conversation with my father before he passed away and it wasn't the military. It was the experience when he came back from Vietnam, you know, okay. and he didn't want that same experience for me. Um, and thankfully, um, since, since then, of course, um, coming back home has always been welcoming and people have been totally supportive. Um, but I think that's what he was most, most fearful of. I don't think it was the military culture itself. I think it was just the way, um, especially black Americans, the way they were treated once they returned back from Vietnam. Yeah. And I, and I'll say, uh, on my, my end, I encourage, I have two adult sons, uh, 36 and 30. So I encouraged them to join the military and they still had no way. Um, yeah. And I encourage them for uh, because I, I again the life that it provided for my family and just all the uh, you know different um, uh, uh, resources and 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 things that the military provided for me. Uh, but they did not. They they chose college, which is great, you know. <laughs> and then I still said, oh, you should you know join and and there's some different routes that you can take in the military because I and I still encourage the military to my nieces, my nephews, friends, mm -hmm. their kids. Uh, I, I think it's just a great stepping stone to, you know, whether college or military, but it's, yeah, for your future, you know, just with all the, you know, discipline, structure and that and so many opportunities, uh, whether it's college or um, and different positions that you can choose uh, in the military. So I, I push them toward the military. <laughs> Either way, they yeah. had to get out of my house. So they had to go. <laughs> <laughs> Which is definitely one way to get that done. Right. right. Uh, and it's interesting. Even after I went to college, I went to grad school um, for public policy. And my thought was. Maybe I will join the military once I finish grad school, go mm -hmm. into OCS, you know, that right. I'll go that yep. route, go that yep. route and go into the Air Force. My father was like, if you go in one way, you go to the Air Force for some reason. That's a common conversation I've heard. But 9-11 happens. Yeah. And that's kind of a spearhead for the Wounded Warrior Project, uh, which is why we're here. To, one of the reasons we're here today. So can somebody or can you both help me understand what is the Wounded Warrior Project and why is it so important? for uh, advocacy and resources for returning veterans, uh, returning service members who are now veterans uh, in our community. Sure, um, so uh, Tanya was talking a little bit earlier about recruiting, so I was actually a Marine Corps recruiter during 9-11. Okay. And that's right when I first learned about the Wounded Warrior Project. And I think um, it's probably, in my opinion, the key mark organization that really addresses that generation of veterans. Um, you know, talking about veterans coming home that are either wounded, injured, or ill, and just the resources and the services that this organization has. Now, initially when they started, it started as a backpack organization that would meet wounded, injured, or will warriors on bedside in hospitals. Uh -huh. And I just uh, mentioned to you earlier, Panama, before the show started, I was just in Germany and had a chance to witness kind of that um, grassroots efforts of the organization while I was in, while I was in Longstroll. And just being able to meet warriors right when they're coming from downrange coming from the battlefield, any kind of injuries that they may have and really saying, hey, we're here to support you. And this backpack had a, you know, a ton of resources, had information. Since then, the organization's obviously grown. We're, we're approaching our 20th anniversary. Uh, so we've had lots of uh, uh, resources and services since then that we've added on to our programming. 
Um, but just to think of, here's this one organization, and certainly there's several others that do similar work, but really meeting warriors where they are and being able to provide uh, to, by saying, hey, we're here for you. We're here to support you. Here are the services that we have. These services come at no cost. And uh, whether you come to us now or you come to us 20 or 30 yeah. years from now, we're going to be here to support you through your journey. Tanya, I read an article uh, that featured you talking about essentially using services on the Wounded Warrior Project. The, uh-huh. Is it Wounded Warrior Talk? I think it was the, or uh, I, I hope I don't get the name of that, that particular no, program. No, okay. I it, yeah, I, yeah. I Googled you because I want to know who's going to be com- right. coming on here. And I find this whole article about talking about, you know, how the counseling services and the the way that it's helped impact your life. And, you know, we're going to talk about this more because of some experience I have, like understanding the shifting demographic of the veterans that return home and the way they utilize services, uh, because mental health has been way more utilized nowadays than it was even considered. Uh, I don't even know if it was compensable for disability purposes uh, generations ago. But, you know, please tell me a bit about your experience with the Wounded Warrior Project um, and, you know, how it's impacted your life. Yeah, um, that's a great question because they have impacted my life. So I, I'll kind of start from the, the beginning and how I got affiliated with Wounded Warrior Project because it, it, it was it was nine years, like nine long years. And like I feel myself welling up now thinking about it. But for nine years, I battled with PTSD, anxiety, and severe depression. And I was on so many medications. I was prescribed antidepressants, sleep medication, pain medication, mood medication. I mean, a ton of meds. And it, it was a, a, a long, tough battle. But now, you know, I get to live this wonderful life because I learned to fight for my mental health in a, in, in a healthy way. And part of me being able to do that is because of the impact that Wounded Warrior Project made on my life. You know, I'm, I'm retired now. And like I said, I, I get to live this, this great life. Um, but because of Wounded Warrior Project and the, the high positive effect that they had on my mental health and the, the variety of programs that they offer, you know, I came out of retirement and I actually worked for <laughs> Wounded Warrior Project as a spokesperson where I get to travel the world and share my story and experiences, um, you know, being an advocate, advocate, so to speak, for, uh, of course, mental health, um, uh, physical health um, and military sexual trauma. So um, it, that and, and again, like Will said, you know, that's what we do here at Wounded Warrior Project. We honor um, our veterans, our warriors by treating them with dignity and respect, and we empower them to say, hey, you know, we're gonna carry you. That's that logo back there that you see. We'll ca- we, we will carry you until you're able to carry yourself, you know, to empower you to carry yourself where you now have control over your life. And if you start feeling a certain way or whatever, like we'll say, we're gonna be here with you from the beginning to the end. And all our programs are free. One, that is an amazing logo, <laughs> by the way. I'm actually glad you yeah, have the behind. I know, right? it. It truly is. Like there's, <laughs> yeah. in terms of logos that actually genuinely speak to the mission of an organization, mm-hmm. like that that really does a good job of um, like exhibiting what that is. And I'm going to yeah. talk a bit, a bit about this advocacy um, and the information gap that exists in, in, in military between services and, and getting them and such that, such that it does. And I'm going to use a very personal story. I was at, I think I was we were in North Carolina, the Outer Banks last year, and I'm in the water, you know, uh, playing with my kids, trying to make sure my kids don't go in the <laughs> water too long, whatever. And I meet this black family, this, this black family out there. You know, our kids are playing around. We start talking and the gentleman is a veteran. Right. And he works in Philadelphia with some organization that tries to get, you know, connect veterans with their with services. Um, and it's so funny. I always end up running into vets and I, t- I make sure to let them know. It's like, look, I used to work on this specifically. Right. Like I worked on the understanding what those vet what those benefits look like. But there was always like how to get everybody from from the military into the benefits that ultimately open the door to all these things that VA has to offer uh-huh. just in general before you even get to a space like the, like the Wounded Warrior Project and all that. And, you know, one thing he told me, he was like, can you come speak to my guys? Because you're telling me everything that I need them to hear. Right. About what's available between all the all the stuff for vets. So, you know, when I got to when I got to to working with VA benefits, I think the for one, PTSD and mental health disorders were not that prevalent. You know, I got I started working there when heart disease just got listed to just got added to the list of presumptives for Vietnam. Right. But over time, mental uh, PTSD, anxiety, military sexual trauma, which was a big thing like that was a that was a battle. 
uh, to get that, you know, into the like into into VA in terms of being something to provide like secondary compensation for and all these things. So. But I know but I feel like there's like people who know are able to go get those services, but there's always the path to try to get people in the door. So how do you all get to the people that need the services most because they really need those services, right? Like being in the military can provide you some very, you know, for all the, for all the good things we can talk about, there are, there's a lot that also comes with that. You might see things that you can't unsee. You might be a part of things you can't forget and it impacts you. So how do you get, how do you get people in the door? That's a, that's a really great question. I mean, part of my team, um, which is connection, uh, we go out to many different uh, facets of just trying to reach out to folks in the community. So one of the things that one of the programs that we have is called Transition Ready, for example, where we actually go on installations while folks are processing out so we can kind of share some of this information. Now, I, I know you didn't serve in the military, Panama. But Tanya, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you can um, attest <laughs> to this. Doing that TAPS program, doing that transitional program, there's a lot of information that's given to veterans, right, or transitioning service members. So oftentimes we don't always remember that information. But Wounded Warrior Project has a few different touch points in where we try to connect with folks, try to connect with them during their transition, try to connect with them post-transition, obviously through our advertising, our media, um, even with our connection team. We call our our service members that have transitioned that are part of our programming, we call them alumni. So we have our alumni team kind of be kind of force multipliers in the community by word of mouth, commercials, advertising, really just trying to get them to connect getting them connected and also getting them really out the house, right? Because I know for me in my own post, you know, post, uh, post-traumatic stress journey, um, getting connected to other warriors, other veterans that had a similar experience was very, very important to me. Um, after my transition, I had isolated a bit because I kind of felt like anyone in the civilian construct didn't really understand my experience. So one of the things that we do here is we know that veterans got to first connect before they can start to heal. Right. So what does that look like? So even when I was thinking about working here, that just that mindset, that opportunity really resonated with me in my personal journey. Um, so I would just to answer your question, circle back. I think it's a multitude of touch points, um, whether it be on the installations when folks are transitioning, whether it be through our programming, through our alumni and our connection team and also our resource center. Um, and additionally, just the things that we're doing out in the community and also having those alumni members be forced multiplies in the community by telling those other women and men that have served. Here's what Wonder Warrior Project is doing. Will has really said it all. I mean, and, and, and Panama right here, what you're doing now, right? Because this is going to touch, you know, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people to get the word out. You know, like Will said, our marketing and our advertising, our, our spokespersons team, we have a team of 12 uh, people on the spokesperson team, uh, you know, motivational speaking, if that's in layman's terms, and where we go out and share our story and we bring awareness to Wounded Warrior Project of all the uh, programs and resources that we do offer uh, to include uh, benefits, uh, um, counseling, benefits program, career counseling. Um, he mentioned the resource center. You mentioned earlier about the Wounded Warrior Talk program, a telephonic, non-clinical uh, program. That's what I, you know, that was one of the main things that helped me out. Um, and then to put me in contact with our Warrior Care Network um, that, that helps with our a inpatient, outpatient mental health program. I mean, we still have so many in our in our our programs and resources. They may not one year or one year we may have twenty. The next year we may have thirty. It depends on what the warrior needs. It's a it's a based on the needs of of the warriors at that time. I mean, the PACT Act. We just you know was part of you know having the PACT Act, uh, which is um, warriors that are exposed to toxic substances. So. Okay. All right, we're going to take a real quick break here. We're going to come back and talk more about the Wounded Warrior Project and advocacy and getting the word out and uh, who this who who this really impacts and how. Uh, so stay tuned here on Dear Culture. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture talking the Wounded Warrior Projects with Tanya Oxendine and Will Williamson. I come from, and as Williams, you pointed out, I come from an international family. You said you're Jamaican. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. Our community hates mental health services. If you can't pray it away, they don't want no parts of it. Usually, we are not we are not big on therapy. Or uh, if God ain't your therapist, then get them off the line. Like we are not big on that um, in general. And 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 the funny thing is, like the immigrant part of my family is white, 
and they still don't they still like nah we're not really about that life like it's it's fine we'll be you'll be fine you'll be okay um not true at all right completely not true so the reason i bring this up is because mental health i pro i think disproportionately impacts communities of color especially black people right we don't seek out I don't want to I don't want to put a blanket on that, but it's it's more prevalent now than it used to be. The, the stigma around mental health seems to be lessening, especially upon uh, on younger, younger people. Right. Like you see younger folks talking about self-care and therapy and all that a lot more than I think older generations do. And the veterans bag is mixed. Right. You have a lot more people leaving the service coming into coming into VA or coming into programs that are probably more OK with that, I would assume. And you all know better than I do. But I know those older generations are probably still. I mean, hell, half of them don't even want to go to the VA because they don't think you look good. I'm just fine. I don't even need my benefits. You know, there was a when I got to working on VA stuff, there was a big fight to get people from Vietnam, even in the door. Right. They just to just to go sign up for benefits. Um, so, you know, speaking about the black community in particular, like. Why is the Wounded Warrior Project essential for like our community, especially when it comes to tending to our mental health and just ensuring our best chances for a a a happy successful you know life that you're in control of we're there to to to, to help them at the end of the day to teach them how to deal with the stress um and i and just like you were saying you know my my uncle he's a vietnam vet purple heart vietnam vet but he refuses to go get the help that he needs and every time i go back home to st augustine I'm saying, uh, Uncle Lorenzo, you have to go in. They're there to help you, you know. I, even, you know, I'll go with you. So anyway, contacted his daughter. She's able to push him so he can get the help that he needs. Because not only does he need the help, we, they deserve the the, the help and the resources, right? They they set the paved the way for us. Your dad, your mom, they paved the way for us. And I just think in the black community, because of the stigma, you know, that, oh, you got to be strong. You got to stand on your own two feet. Black people don't do that. Like you said, oh, you can pray it away. That 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 hasn't helped us, you know. And and if we, we have to continue to talk about it. Um, I think some of the young people are getting it. Um, um, us old heads, we're going to have to catch up, you know, <laughs> right? Um, because, and I understand that some people may not have access to health care, um, but we have to continue to talk about it. We have to continue to market this, um, put the information out, put the word out that there are organizations like Wounded Warrior Project, Veterans Administrations, other veteran service organizations that are there to help. And, and I understand that people want to be, you know, are stubborn and want to be independent, but let's really look at that definition of independent. That means to be all alone, to do everything by yourself. Here in itself causes stress, you know, because stress is the number one, well, you know, excessive stress, severe stress is the number one cause of, of, of um, um, uh, mental health issues. Uh, we we've just got to really, at the end of the day, like I did with my uncle, you, you have to pick him up and almost take him down there. Have somebody, <laughs> yeah, seriously, because they deserve it and they need it. You know, I, I I have, and then a lot of older people, they don't have you know their family around them a lot. But those are the those of us that are there, and then we know and we have this information. We can't continue to hold this information into ourselves. We have to share it and put it out there and. Stop being ashamed and all of that stuff because we we say we want to help people, but are we really helping them by holding that information in? We got to get out there and, and, and help people and, and let these walls down because all those walls do is keep people out. We got to let the walls down. Have you all noticed that, you know, what I said was basically that younger people are getting it. So let's say younger veterans, I would assume, are availing themselves more of these. Services. But is that actually even true? Like, is that true, Will? Like, am I? I'm assuming yeah. that's the case just because of society, but the military culture is different, right? It's a, it's a different, it's a different culture entirely unto itself. Is that accurate? I, I believe so. Um, you know, 17% of our post 9-11 veterans identify as being black. And as Tati mentioned about her family, I have a very similar family. So my father and my three uncles weren't even in the United States for three months until they were drafted into Vietnam. And when I started talking about my issues, um, yes, my dad looked at me like I had three heads and was like, you just need a man up. And you're talking about being Jamaican, being black, being from New York, right? And also being a Marine. So it's, it's all of those kind of layers. And I think what the younger generation has done has really kind of changed the narrative on it. So 
I'll, I'll share with you as a quick personal story. So my uncle, a couple of months ago, was really struggling bad. And he went to the, the VA in the Bronx. He still lives in New York and went to the Bronx VA and just didn't feel included. And he knows that I work here. And I had to have a conversation with him. But I'm like, look, look, Uncle, I'm not trying to get into your business, but you have to understand, like, these services are here to support you. You know, and he, of course, gave me the, the riot act about, you know, that's for weak people and you're a man and you're Jamaican and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, let me explain to you what it's done in my life. You know, and I, I you know, kind of just walked him through my experiences, right? Someone that was struggling really, really bad. And he knows my story, right? Couldn't sleep, um, you know, drinking, just does not see the world the way that I see it today. And, uh, and since then, only I could have that conversation with him, right? right. My cousins couldn't yep. have that conversation yep. with him. Other people couldn't. So I think to your earlier question with Tanya about Wounded Warrior Project and being a part of the conversation, I think Wounded Warrior Project is actually vital to the conversation, right? Because not only are we serving you know, all veterans, we do serve black veterans as well in that population, right? So, you know, and, and not just external to the organization as well as internal. So as, as a person in leadership, my team knows that on Wednesday mornings between seven o'clock and 8.30, Will's on the phone with this therapist, right? So how do we as kind of ambassadors of, of the cause, right, kind of bend and change the narrative? And I've had teammates say to me, wow, you've made, you know, mental health so much more normal. You've made it uh, easy to have a conversation about because as a person in leadership, we all have a responsibility, whether you're in leadership or not. But I just try to use my platform, whether it be internal to the organization with my teammates, whether they be warrior teammates or non-warrior teammates, right? But also to the um, to, to, to folks outside. And Tanya, for example, she's on that team that does a wonderful job really going around the country, around the world, really sh- kind of sharing those stories so that other warriors can kind of see themselves in that experience. And in my experience, I think that's what's really going to bend the needle. You all have mentioned a story that I have. My father did not go to VA until I started working on VA issues, right? And at that point, I'm like, dude, you need to go to VA. <laughs> like, you ain't been able to hear Bad out of one it. of your ears forever. You always talk about your knees are bad. Like, why don't you just go and let them tell you no, right? Like, l- listen, go get go get assessed. And if they're like, nah, you, there's nothing wrong with you, then, then you can keep on living that life you've been living and nothing changes. But you did all this time in the military. Why not? Like, why not go avail yourself of these services available to you? And, you know, the one way that I had to go about doing this was with my mother. Like, I'm talking to my <laughs> mom nonstop, like, Ma, you have got to get this man in the door. Like, I'm telling you all with my firsthand knowledge as somebody who works intimately with all this stuff right. on a daily day basis, you got to go. So. What services does the Wounded Warrior Project provide to caregivers and the people who have to support the veterans through um, through the struggle to hopefully the better, you know, the better version of 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 tomorrow? You know, what what services are available for caregivers? I'm really happy that you asked that question because um, and I I felt to kind of say this in the beginning. But not only do we serve the warriors, we, we serve their family support members and caregivers. Right. So all the services that are afforded to the warrior are actually afforded to the family support members as well. And I'm not going to say anything bad about the VA. The VA has been tremendous to me. It's been tremendous to my family. But I, what I think the when the warrior does also to that conversation, to the question you asked earlier, Panama, was I think it kind of helps liaise our warriors into the VA system as well. Okay. Because th- this organization, it doesn't feel like the VA, right? It's not a big building with 15 floors and you kind of get the sense of, bureaucracy and it's difficult, right? Once a warrior is registered, I think, you know, whether it be for for our benefit services, like we have a team of folks here that actually help warriors get their benefits, right? So if a warrior has been never filed for a benefit or has been denied for a benefit or is looking for an increase in benefits, right? Like if you're a warrior, an alumni teammate, you can also qualify for those benefit services. I think it feels a little different, right? Working with one of our teammates in that, in that particular um, uh, process versus saying working with the VA. I'm not trying to suggest that everyone needs to come to Wounded Warrior Project to, to, for us to advocate for that, but I just think it just it just feels different for the warrior experience, right? Because again, the VA can feel awfully huge and big and bureaucratic and everything else. Um, but again, to circle back to your question, family support members, caregivers, and warriors alike all receive those uh, all the benefits at Wounded Warrior Project. So if I was a family support member and my active duty person was having a hard time, but I also needed someone to talk to through the WWP talk that Tanya was describing earlier, I can too also use those services as well to be able to um, unpack whatever I'm going through. And I was going to say, you know, the same thing in, in, with the caregiver uh, program that we have. We even have uh, 
three caregivers on our Warrior Speak team, um, that they go out and talk to other caregivers and other uh, family members and family support members about how they take care of their warrior um, and how they have been taking care of their warrior and how that affects them or, and, and the, the experiences that they have with that. Um, and then our long-term support for our, um, the, our independence program for our, our catastrophic, uh, really uh, catastrophically wounded uh, personnel. Um, and we provide long-term support for those personnel as well. And those are, uh, you know, a lot of our warriors that need their family care, you know, the caregivers, uh, th they need them with them to, to help them out. We've been, we've been talking a bit about, we've used some where I'm talking about VA versus, you know, wounded right. warrior and everything. And I wonder if people who are listening might not even understand the purpose of veteran service organizations as a whole, because this is, this is what you all are, right? A veteran service organization right. um, that provides help. So one of the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, well, you just mentioned like, you know, helping people go through the benefits process and that can be a very daunting process for anybody. Right. Like, I, <laughs> and it's it's less so now than when everything was 100 percent done on paper back in, you know, as early as the early 2000s. Right. At least it's sure. digital now. And when you leave the military, they send your records and they didn't used to do that either. Right. That, that, that seamless transition process. I don't know how seamless it is now at this point, but it's you know, it's 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 a thing. So. You know, like Tanya, could you speak a bit to the the utility and the importance of veteran service organizations as a whole to ensuring that veterans get all these things that they need to begin with? And like, you know, for people who don't understand what that even means and what we're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, I think veteran service organizations as a whole are, are there to just what it describes in his name to service the veterans, you know, just to reinforce that they're there for them, that they care um, to, so that they can, you know, be empowered to be stronger, uh, to have resilience and to pers persevere over the issues or things that they need, right? Um, you know, Wounded Warrior Project, not only do we offer physical health and wellness programs, we offer mental health programs. We have adventure programs where, uh, uh, sports programs where they can do physical fitness uh, opportunities. Uh, Will mentioned earlier the um, resource center. So it, it's it's the veteran services organization. How do I say? It? It's like a uh, it fills the gap from where we when we leave the military for our transition assistance program. We may not get everything there, and you know it just kind of fill the gap in between for for the veterans administration and other veteran service organization. The Wounded Warrior Project. I mean. Everything that I've read, everything that I was familiar with, you know, sounds like the kind of organization that if it's available to you, you need to avail yourself of opportunities within, especially for the mental health struggles. Um, without being too specific, you know, and, and, you know, Tanya, I think you're a perfect example of this. Like, tell me about some of the success stories and what, like, people love to come back and tell you how, how things have changed their lives. That's something mm -hmm. that that I think when when you're in the service business and one that actually impacts people in a positive way, the feedback loop is real. It exists in that space, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, Tanya, we'll start with you. You know, can you tell me some, uh, you know, other success stories and how that's, how it has made the community better by existing and by providing these services? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you're looking at one right now <laughs> because, um, you know, after serving and after I came back, I, I, I've deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan. And okay. after my deployment in Afghan Afghanistan in 2012, I just I just hit rock bottom. I mean, it, it so much went on over there. We lost so many soldiers. Um, you know, it, it in that in that war during that time period, and I, I was a wreck. You know, it, it, all the childhood trauma had came back. The, the military trauma had came back at that point, and I, I was a mess. And like I said earlier, for nine years, I was darn near in my in my bed every day, just depressed and 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 sick to death. Um, and and I will say this: my mental fortitude had to kick in because I remember okay. I was. Th this is how it happened. I was at the Pentagon. That was my last duty assignment at the Pentagon in 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 in, in D.C. And I was looking out the window. And I said, you know, today is a great day to go for a swim. Now, mind you, I cannot swim, right? But I, I knew that was a great day to go for a swim. So I told my colleagues, hey, I'm going to go downstairs. Um, you know, I'll, I'll see you guys a little bit later. I need to run some errands. Um, and so I'm driving and driving. I go downstairs and get my car and I'm driving because I was looking for a bridge to drive off of because I knew that I could not swim. I wanted to kill myself. But I found, I found myself 
at the counter, the Fort Belvoir mental um, health counter. And I said, I need help. I can't do this. Because at the end of the day, when my mental fortitude kicked in, all I could think about on that drive and saying I was going to kill myself was my two sons. Um, and I didn't want to leave a legacy of suicide for them. So, um, you know, that, that, that's what Wounded Warrior Project has done for me, you know, and to be there. And, and just one thing led to another again. So Fort Belvoir knows about Wounded Warrior Project. They know about the VA. Hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? Nothing is closed in and say, oh, we want you all to ourselves. They want us to heal. They want us to get better. Right. better. So <laughs> I was informed about Wounded Warrior Project. I couldn't make the call. They helped make the call. My youngest son was home with me. And I tell you, that boy's right. a trooper. Yeah, I'm telling you, he's a trooper. And I'm telling you, if it wasn't for my youngest son and, and that little dog of mine, I'm telling you, Panama, I wouldn't be sitting here right now because, man, it just, I mean, it just it just really made a difference. And then for Wounded Warrior Project to come in and to say, you know what, don't worry about nothing. Well, man, I got you. I got you. You don't have to, we don't care if you feel ashamed. We don't care about this little like, the crime I'm doing. You know, we, we, we got you. We're going to have your back. And we're going to hold you up, sister, until it's time for you to stand on your own two feet. And I, I mean, I just, I'm just thankful for them. I'm thankful for other VSOs. I'm thankful for the VA. And I know certain organizations get a bad rap, but God darn, you know, let's, let's talk about the facts of what they are doing so that people don't have to suffer and... You know, like I was suffering for nine years and, and, and that kind of thing. We still have people suffering. And let's let's just talk about the facts and, and, and the good that they're doing so we can spread that throughout the world and throughout our veteran community because there's so many people like yourself who's doing this and, and for, for us veterans and for the black community. And, I mean, that's just where it starts at. We got to talk about this shit, but then also the veteran or whoever needs that help, we have to come and say, I need help. Because sometimes we don't know that somebody's out there and that they need help. So the only girl uh, I, would cry yeah. on the darn podcast, right? I mean, listen, yo, well, your I'm testimony, your t- too. listen, <laughs> I'm a host. I got to keep myself yeah. together, but your testimony is your testimony. And I yeah. think, I mean, what's more powerful than a personal yeah. testimony about something that, Absolutely. you know, because while you were talking, my first thought was like, how did you even make the, get to the first step? Because when you're stuck somewhere, that's hard to do. Like you can't even see the step. And so, absolutely. you know, you sharing that is helpful because it's like, how do you get there to begin with? You know, and and I mean, look, your personal testimony is as good as it's going to get. Right. And so Tanya, thank you. I've, I've, I've heard Tanya share a story before and um, it always resonates with me when she does. Um, you know, I was just in Germany a couple of weeks ago, as I was sharing with you, Panama. And um, I just recently met a warrior there. And uh Young, young, young brother, right? And uh, 32 years old, sergeant first class in the army, and he was actually escorting one of his battle buddies from Poland to Longshore. Okay. While he was at the hospital, his name is Jamal, and he, and I asked him permission if it was okay to share his story. He said it was. And while he's in Longshore, he wasn't feeling too well. He was just like, you know, I'm kind of feeling kind of woozy, I'm just not really feeling my best. And uh, so the, the nurse said, hey, let me check your blood pressure. Let's draw some blood. On March 30th, which is pretty recent, right? He just found out he had stage four cancer. And, um, you know, I'm from New York. He's from Newark, New Jersey. Um, I used to live in, in Jersey when I worked at a previous employer. So, you know, we, we got this connection going. He looks like me. You know, we're just having this really in-depth conversation. And I, I pretty I, I talk to him pretty much every day. And um, I'm really proud of his resilience. I'm really proud of the work that Wounded Warrior Project is doing, also my team, um, just to kind of demonstrate some of the coordinated efforts. So kind of in Tanya's story, he w- probably wouldn't have learned about the Wounded Warrior Project if it wasn't for the relationship that we had with the hospital that we currently have with the hospital in Longshore. So my team and I were up there that day. I, I kind of felt like I was a doctor at the hospital that day because we walked into every ward just because of this logo. Um, we coordinated his uh, his medevac from Longshore to Vamsey, Brook Army Medical Center. My team, I have a team in Texas as well, they were there to meet him once he arrived. And he wrote this note to our CEO just about his experience, and he talked about where the medevac and all those other things were uncomfortable. Everything that Wounded Warrior Project provided for him increased his comfort level. <laughs> as an organization, we flew his family out, his girlfriend, his son, he has a two-year-old son, not fair, 
Um, he, we flew him out. We flew his girlfriend out. We put them in lodging. All of this is no expense to the warrior. And I don't want to talk about resources and money at the moment, but we just wanted to make sure we had a coordinated effort that his family could be there to support him. On Sunday, I had a conversation with him because I took my daughter to brunch, and he said to me, he said, well, tell me what you ate at brunch. Tell me about your experience. And I called him up, and he said to me last night, he said, man, I'm just so glad we met before I died. And I got to be honest with you, it, it just it just destroyed me. And I, I wasn't even quite confident I'd be ready for this conversation today because of that. And it just really put back in perspective for me why I do the work that I do or why I chose this organization, right? Because I'm hearing my story in all voices, including voices that look like me. Beautiful. Right. And to know that our organization serves all veterans. Right. All, you know, and our post 9-11 veterans. And it's even special that even folks that are not veterans yet, that even our active duty personnel, in many instances, given the relationship that we, we have a long show, further resonates with me. So this has nothing to do with me. I'm, I'm so proud of my team and how we were able to support him. And uh, one of the things that he had said to me, which was interesting, I was actually taking a shuttle from long show to Frankfurt at 4 a.m. to catch my flight. I mentioned to one of my team members that, you know, he's a Yankees fan. And without being prompted to honor and empower, that's, our, that's part of our mantra, to honor and empower our warriors, our team went out and got him a New York Yankee jersey and, and, a, and, a, and a fitted just to make sure that he knew that we were there to support him. So it's just small details of someone that's going through, obviously, a very, very challenging time. But we're not just paying attention to the needs of him. We're also paying attention to the needs of his family, you know, um, and making sure that he's comfortable um, depending on where God's going to take him from from now, right? So, um, proud of work here. You know, just really excited to see what we're doing in the community. And it is appreciated. And wow, that was heavy. Uh, it was heavy. <laughs> the, the sorry, I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, but it's look. It's uh, no apologies needed. I mean, as as I have a lot of fun on my podcast. We talk about all kind of all manner of things, but you got to make space for things that also genuinely impact and genuinely and hit. And it just, even that phrasing, like, I'm glad to meet you before I die. Like that, that hit me like that. <laughs> that I can't imagine being the person he's talking to. Like that hit me right here. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I'm just appreciative Which, of, of that. If, yeah. if I could just add one last part, you know, it's, yeah. and it's so important, right? Because we all have our own mental health that we're trying to care for. And our mental, I heard a, a really cool uh, term yesterday on the podcast, mental fitness. Right. And so now I can't I can't carry that. Right. It's heavy. Like he just said it to me yesterday. So on Wednesday, like I told you earlier, I'll be meeting with my therapist. All right. At 730 a.m. My team knows not to knock on my door. I like to come to work a little bit earlier. But that is something I'm going to impact in therapy. All right. And that's something that I'm going to probably have a conversation about or I may even utilize talk. Right. Um, just so I can be able to unpack that, because for me to carry that as a father. Right. As as a, as a son, as a person. Right. That That's just a lot of a lot, right? And um, but I, I did have a moment where I had to take a knee and just kind of tear up a little bit, and um, and explain to my very inquisitive twelve-year-old daughter that um, you know, this is what he had shared with me, and and, and she told me, Dad, it's going to be okay. So yeah, very important. All right. All right. Well, we're going to take one final break here. We're going to come back. We're going to lighten the mood a little bit uh, yeah. with our final segments here at Dear Culture, and then we'll find out how anybody listening can find out more about the Wounded Warrior Project and where so stay tuned here on dear culture all right we're back here on dear culture and we're here with the final segments of what we like to do on my show which are uh in the sense of this podcast probably going to be a little bit more on the joy joyous side of things but a way to end the show on a high note so we do two things here we do black fashions which is a confession about your blackness something people will be surprised to know about you because you're black <laughs> uh, i've heard some of the most ridiculous things ever on this podcast because of this because i asked this question <laughs> Um, I've met somebody, a friend of mine, actually, and I, I, this didn't change our friendship, but it could have, who told me that she puts ketchup and mustard in her grits. And I've never looked at her the same way since. Right. You see the faces you all are making? <laughs> yeah. Like, you said, Will, I see your face. Right. And Tanya, you from down south. I don't know if you eat grits or not, but uh, that I ain't do, right. We're sugar. We're sugar. Right. Not there, ketchup. Okay. <laughs> Got to have that <laughs> argument. Right. So <laughs> a black fashion. Do either one of you have a black fashion for me that you can share with the people who will be listening to this podcast? Who wants to start? I don't know where you want to go. I, I, I guess I can start because I've always. Okay. Um, so I, 
I learned African American experience while serving in the Marine Corps, believe it or not. Um, okay. So I, I'm very Jamaican, but um, so for me, it's uh, potato salad at picnics, right? Like I don't understand why somebody would bring this mayonnaise filled dish, <laughs> right? And it's 98 degrees outside, and it's in some kind of a cooler. And then when you open it up, it's always like this kind of <laughs> separation of potato salad and this <laughs> this <laughs> substance, right? I don't want to call it water, but I'm like, mayonnaise and, 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 and heat doesn't sound like it goes well together. So I'm not a big fan of eating potato salads at barbecues. <laughs> Definitely got to get there first. You got to get there early. Yeah. There's no leftovers yeah. on barbecue uh, potato salad. None yes, of sir. that. <laughs> okay. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I, un I actually understand. I like potato salad, but I'm definitely with you on the where it's served matters very it, it matters a lot. So absolutely. Okay. All right, Tanya, what about you? Um, so I have uh, the two kind of. Uh, <laughs> so my black question is, uh, you know, stereotypical maybe black people gonna whoop their damn sure they gonna whoop your behind. Um, but I didn't spank my kids. <laughs> I, I did. I didn't whoop my kids. So, uh, and with my personality, most people think that you know because I'm so ah, ah, ah they thought you know that, that they would assume that I did. So, but I, I didn't whoop my sons. And the other is uh, when I got my puppy uh, over nine years ago. She, um, I take her to doggy daycare, and my black friends like you do what? We can regular pay pay for dog on regular children, human daycare. You taking your dog, Miss Haughty Tall, you know so. <laughs> You yeah. know, well, two things to that. One, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't put my hands on my kids at all. Like, I, I'm a, yeah. come from a southern family. I definitely got Me too. Caught, caught a few. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. But yes, I was sir. very intentional about the fact that, like, I'm not, yeah. we're not doing this. Like, I'm just, yeah, not going. I was like, I, there got to be another way for me. That, that's how, that's yeah. how I felt. Like, which is, yeah, has caused some interesting <laughs> conversations in my house with my wife, oh, who yes. definitely is from from that from that school. Was like, listen. But she, she, funny enough, she's very much like, listen, because you have decided we're not doing this, I'm gonna respect this. And but this is difficult. And I'm just like, listen, it's hard for me, too. Sometimes kids right, will right. test you in ways that you have never been tested. But right. I'm yes. very much in the, uh, yeah, like, try to talk it out. Kind yeah. of, it's, it's, I think my, kid, my kids have way more opinions than I was ever allowed to have. But, oh, know. absolutely. <laughs> or, or more think. <laughs> right. I mean, listen, these kids have to think through things, right? And like, so, yeah. okay. Anyway, all right. Well. Thank you for those black fashions. We also like to add a black recommendation here, which is a recommendation by Ford about something black that you enjoy, think other people need to be up on or aware of. Tanya, do you have a black recommendation for me? Well, I'll, since we were talking about that, you said we could do a plug. I'm gonna go yeah, ahead and put please, my plug please do. in. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, here, coming very soon, I will be launching my podcast, mainly through YouTube and, and these social media platforms before I go you know, the audio route, but um, my podcast is, is my name, Tanya Oxendine, uh, uh, Second Opinion, <laughs> and um, it's about health, black health, and it's um, my goal is to rally black women to take accountability and responsibility for our behavior and our actions in relationships with black men and to not leave our black men. I know there are other circumstances, but not to leave our black men and for us to come together in our intimate relationships, long lasting, long term. Okay. And you, when, when yeah. did you say that's going to be coming out? Uh, this month. Uh, uh, May okay. 9th is my first, May 9th is my first um, got you. Okay. go to. I don't know yeah. if that was a, I don't know if you was, but she's like, I don't know if I need to share that date or not, just in case it got to come out a day or two <laughs> well, later. It's, it's, but you know. Yeah, no, it's, it's coming. I, I got to do it. I got to go ahead and stick to the all mission. All right. We'll be looking yeah. out for that. <laughs> all right. What about you, Will? You know, um, for me and my mental health journey, kind of circling back to that, um, I think it's important that as we're, I think sometimes as a, as a black person, right, when we're going into certain environments, we don't feel comfortable asking for recommendations. So if someone was going to seek out a therapist, they may not feel comfortable saying, I want a black therapist, or I want a woman therapist, or I want a male therapist. Through my journey, I think it's important to have that conversation. Um, six years ago, when I started on my mental health journey, I just, gave, I just took whatever the VA gave me to kind of just deal with that kind of military-related trauma. As I've matured through my therapy, um, one of the things I do now, which I have a new therapist, is that I now have a woman, uh, and she's a person of color. She's, uh, she's Puerto Rican. And I just think it's really, really critical that we advocate for ourselves, right, when we go into some of those spaces, because you're allowed to, right? You should feel comfortable that you can ask for what you need, right? And what you may have needed at 30 may not be what you need at 40, right? So, you know, feel very empowered, 
right back to that honor and empowering piece about saying, hey, I know you're providing this particular service, right? Is there a potential that I can have a woman to speak to or can I have a person of color to speak to? And let that organization kind of help you out to do their due diligence to get you the right fit. So I think that's yeah. really critical. Can I say right, one thing, Ann, to that, yeah. uh, Panama? Please. Will, I, of course, you, when, as people talk, then you're like, oh, I, you know, this and I thought about that. Same way, right? So I, on purpose, chose a white male therapist. I didn't want to go to a black female. We got our own stuff. I didn't want to. I, I chose a white male therapist. And I tell you what, that was the most enlightening. He brought so much to me. He learned so much from me and vice versa. Um, and then I, I want to, you know, end by saying this, that um, Audre Lorde, she's a um, author, um, Audre Lorde, a black author, and she said, uh, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. So, yeah. All so right. We got to care, care for ourselves better. All right. Well, look, uh, thank you all both for being here. You are much appreciated. Your stories are, are heartwarming um, and vulnerable. And, you know, I got something out of this. You even got emotion out of me as a host <laughs> of something where I'm typically having a lot of fun. And that that, that means a lot. So, please. Uh, Will, can you tell people where they can find out more about the Wounded Warrior Project? Uh, if they're interested, if they're looking, if they don't even know that they're looking, how can they find out information? Absolutely. So first and foremost, they can absolutely go to WoundedWarriorProject.org and they can get a whole host of information on our website. But like I mentioned, we have a resource center that actually sits right outside of my office. <laughs> and we have a great team out there. Um, that telephone number is one 997 2586 we're open between 9 and 9 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And those women and men that work in our resource center are excellent at kind of just listening, triaging, seeing where to kind of direct the warrior to go. But we're looking at the whole warrior experience. So whether it be the website or it be calling into the resource center, um, those are the, the two avenues to engage with us. All right. Well, thank you both for being here. Uh, this this episode, which will air during May, during Mental Health Awareness Month, will uh no doubt be helpful to somebody, some bodies who needed to hear this, who need, who are looking for, looking for something. And maybe this is what they're looking for. So I appreciate you both uh, innately for being here. And thank you to everybody who is listening to Dear Culture and this, this episode in particular. Um, Dear Culture is an original podcast of the Grio Black Podcast Network. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong, edited by Jeff Trudeau. And Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. Uh, my name is Panama Jackson, your host. Thank you all. Have a black one. We started this podcast to talk about not just what black writers write about, but how. Well, personally, it's on my bucket list to have one of my books banned. <laughs> I know that's probably bad, but Ooh. I think- Ooh, spicy. They were yelling N-word, go home. And I was looking around for the N-word because I knew it couldn't be me because I was a queen. <laughs> but I'm telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, to start to live our lives and to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place. My, my biggest strength throughout throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically black women. I mean, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was like a little kid. Like the banjo was blackly black, right? Mm -hmm. For many, many, African. many years, yes. everybody knew. Cause sometimes I'm just doing some Sam that, <laughs> cause I just like, <laughs> want to do it. An honor to be here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Keep shining bright. And we, and, and like you said, we gonna keep writing black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts.